Ready, set, go. Because you won't listen to anything I'm about to say at all. Not at all. We are starting on our central nervous system discussion. Central nervous system, of course, as you know from your quiz, is brain and spinal cord. So the first part of this lecture is all about the brain and how it's organized. I know you're not thinking about this, but when you come back from spring break, you will do a dissection on the sheet brain. And Professor Innens is going to tell you about the white matter, and the dark matter, and the different loads. I put on your desks the different, well, I put on your desk a reminder that's a skull, and the skull, this painted skull, reminds you of the different uh, bones, remember? Frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobes, occipital lobe, spinal bone, that sort of thing. So for the soft tissue underneath of them, the parts of the brain are named for the bone that protects them. So the frontal lobe, of course, would be underneath the frontal bone. The parietal lobe would be underneath both of the parietal bones. The occipital lobe would be underneath the occipital bone. So what you learned for lab unit one continues now. You cannot purge that memory. You have to keep that going forward. I'm going to go through the different lobes and tell you what their specialities are. So each lobe, named for the bone that protects them, has a very specific function. The anatomy is actually very boring. It's the physiology that's actually really cool. It looks like I don't have a lot to talk about. I could race through this PowerPoint and finish it before you even go for your break, before your lab practicum. I don't want to do that. I still have you on Thursday, which is our last day before spring break. And when you come back from spring break, you all will be mushy-brained. You are a well-trained oil right now with a wheel and cog, everything. It, you are so in tune right now. When you come back, I won't have lost you. I encourage you to stay in time and keep up with your studies. Don't just go, I'm on spring break. I don't have to really study this. No, you really do. Your grades are on the line. So don't, we don't have a fall break for students. We don't. Come back to me, well-oiled, come back, well-trained, keep up with your studies, do not go on, quote, break. Please don't, I'm not, I'm not. We'll go through all the parts of the brain and tell you their specialities. Your brain is a supercomputer. There is nothing higher than your brain. Your brain really does problem solve. And in order for your brain to function well, you actually need to sleep. Do you get enough sleep every night? What is your sleep hygiene? And Olivia, that does not mean that you take a shower before you go to bed. That's not what sleep hygiene means. Can you solve this riddle? I just wrote on the board the letters H I J K. L M N O.
It's a riddle. What is it? It's something I see in this room right now. And it's tangible. Don't solve it. Hannah, don't solve it. Only because I know your sister has had me, so shh, shh. It's a real thing. And if you look at those letters before you go to bed at night, just for just put on a piece of paper right before you're to turn off your light, your brain will try and problem solve that. And your brain will make you sleep and dream the answer. Your brain is a supercomputer. All the parts are working together. Today you have a lab exam. You've been memorizing the origins, assertions, and actions. If you have not slept well, you, you will not do well today. You won't. You won't. If you've been cramming, you won't do well. Your brain needs rest. The different parts of the brain that I'm going to lecture on need time to communicate to each other, to file all of these memories appropriately. You need sleep. You need restorative sleep. That's a real thing. A lot of times when I get through this lecture, as I go through this lecture, I get a lot of questions. I don't think I'll get any today, because you're not gonna pay attention today at all. But on Thursday, I expect a lot of questions. <coughs> we started to learn about terms last week. A ganglion is a collection of cell bodies outside of the central nervous system. You will start to dissect ganglia. Professor Ennens probably won't show you them. I'm going to show up in class, in lab. I'm going to make sure you see them. They are tangible structures. You can pick them up with your forceps. You can see them. These are not microscopic structures. Not always. You can see them. And I want you to see them. A ganglion is a collection of neuronal cell bodies outside of the central nervous system. Ganglia is plural for that, that word. Center. Center slash nucleus. A nucleus is a collection of neuronal cell bodies inside of the central nervous system. And they oftentimes share a common function. So that's the reason why I will say a nucleus is synonymous with a center. Oftentimes you, you can't separate those two. Nuclei, parts of the brain, cell bodies, neuronal cell bodies, somas that have a common function. And I will definitely tell you about centers in your brain, nuclei, that are performing certain functions for your body. A nerve. A nerve is a collection of axons outside of the central nervous system. Last week I asked you to pinch your ulnar nerve, remember, above the medial epicondyle. epicondyle. And I said, if you got that right, your pinky finger and your ring finger would start to be tingly, right? I said, if you can't find it, give it to me. I will find it for you. I will pinch it for you. That's the last thing I need. My teacher abused me. She pinched me so hard. I don't need that. Nerve plexi. That's plural for plexus. You will learn when you cut open your cats in the next few weeks. You will see up here in the shoulder and neck region, you will see a network. 
How many of you ever played Cat's Cradle? Do you even remember that? You would you would have strings and you'd be like over over. Look at Cynthia. She's she's already doing it. She's like. So you will see in the neck region and even in the lumbar and groin region, you will see a, la a lattice work of nerves that are plexi. To me, it reminds, it reminds me in grade school playing Cat's Cradle where we were just over under. You remember that, Cynthia, right? They are going to be an intertwining of nerves and that, that provides redundancy. If you have damage to a nerve that serves a certain region of your body, wouldn't you like to have redundancy so that other nerves can still serve the duties and the functions of that limb? If one nerve was severed, you wouldn't lose the functionality of your whole upper limb or lower limbs. We will see, we will see cervical plexi. We will see lumbar plexi down here serving the lower member. It, it, it's redundancy. If one nerve is severed, others can take over. You won't necessarily be without feeling, without muscle movement. You won't necessarily be paralyzed if one nerve is severed. So plexi serve as redundancy. Funiculi, funiculus. Funiculi will be a group of axons traveling in the central nervous system. They will be going up, they will be afferent, or they will be going down. They will be motor, efferent, outgoing. Funiculi are fun. Fun. They're going to serve a role. That's in chapter 17 that we will cover those. The pathways. Things that to and fro. Afferent, efferent. Afferent, sensory. What should you do about it? That's efferent. That's motor, outgoing. What should you do about it? Cortex. The outer layers of your brain about two to four millimeters of your brain, the outer layers of your brain. Okay, so I can, when I was in anatomy with medical students, we took a bone saw and we went And then we took a chisel We popped open the calvaria, and it sounded like opening a pickle jar. So Joyce's sweet calvaria, I can score around it, pop open her calvaria. Once I remove the calvaria, the hard bone, I would see her beautiful swishy brain. I would first have to cut through the meninges, and I will talk about the meninges. These are the layers, the protective layers around her soft brain. It's a lot like, well, how do you put, how do you store your meat in the freezer? How do you store? What do you put? Put them in a what? In a bag. What kind of bag? A Ziploc bag. I know that if I put meat in a Ziploc bag, it still can get freezer burn. So I want to protect it even more. I might put my meat first in saran wrap. And then around that, to protect it from moisture that might accumulate, I might put paper towels around that before I put it in a Ziploc bag. So there are layers of protection around the meat that I'm putting in the freezer. Your brain is the same way. There are layers of protection around it. Those are the meninges, the saran wrap, 
the paper towels, the Ziploc bagging. <coughs> or for some of you, <coughs> some of you might use foil. Meninges, wrapping around the brain. So I'm going to use Joyce and I'm going to cut through her meninges. And some of them are actually quite thin. One of them is called the Dura Mater. Dura Mater. It means tough mother. I am your tough mother. I'm your Dura Mater. I'm not your Pia Mater. Pia Mater means gentle mother. I am not Pia Mater. I'm Dura Mater. Professor Innes is probably Pia Mater. <laughs> not me. These are the wrappings, the saran wrap, the paper towels, the Ziploc baggies. So I have to cut through the Dura Mater, the thick mother, the tough mother, expose Joyce's brain. And once I have her brain exposed, over here, underneath her frontal bone, would be her frontal lobe. Critical thinking, thought, before movement thoughts. What does that mean? Pre-movement, before movement thoughts. As soon as Karen stops lecturing, I'm gonna get out of the seat, I'm gonna go outside, I'm going to finish studying the origins, assertions, and actions. It's too late for me to go. Oh, I'm too <laughs> Two and a half hours, yeah. It's too late. <laughs> as soon as Karen stops lecturing, I'm going to go get a coffee, I'm going to go study another origin insertion and action. Even though Kara three weeks ago said, you should be studying origins, insertions, and actions, learn about five a day. I don't think so, if you have those out right now. It's pretty <laughs> Her parietal lobe, big, big bones, parietal lobe. If I zapped Joyce's brain along her parietal lobe, she would, if she, and, and, and we do this all the time, we take off the calvaria, we open the meninges, and we zap different parts of the brain. We do brain surgery, and we have the person away there is no sensation. It's weird. The brain is nothing but neurons, yet it's not innervated. Do you understand the difference? There's no sensation. There's no neurons. Tell If I touch Joyce's brain, she wouldn't know I was touching her. Her meninges, for sure, the coverings of her brain, those have neurons that are innervating the meninges. That's why you get headaches when you drink too much and you're dehydrated. Your brain actually shrinks in size and pulls away from the meninges and the meninges are held in place by the skull and the nerves that innervate the meninges are being pulled away as your brain shrinks because you're dehydrated and you feel pain. But if I had Joyce's brain exposed and I went, she would feel nothing. She would likely report if I went, Meh. she would say, Kara, I feel a weird sensation in my pinky toe. And if I went somewhere else, she would say, now I feel a weird sensation like I have an itch on my shoulder. Different parts of the brain are responsible for creating movement, interpreting, interpreting sensations, and if I stimulate them, there's another part of her brain where if I stimulated it, she might go, or went, zap. It's weird, it's a supercomputer. So I'm gonna go through the different cortices, the outer layer of the brain, about two to four millimeters of neurons and what they do. They help interpret sensations, 
They help interpret sensations and then dictate an outcome, a command. It's the best computer you've ever owned and it's in your head. And most of you don't take care of it appropriately. It's amazing. Cerebral hemispheres. You learned in anatomy, when you learned about the bones, you learned about the frontal bone, parietal bones, temporal bones, occipital bones, but you learned about this sagittal suture. Remember that? It kind of goes straight down the middle. And when we do that in your brain, the soft tissue, the brain, it's two cerebral hemispheres. There's a right cerebral hemisphere and a left. And you've probably heard, are you right-brained or are you left-brained? Are you right or left? Left. So you say, really? most of us are both. We like to say, oh, I'm right-brained, oh, I'm left-brained. No, most of us in this room, we're a happy blend of both. Both. Very few of us have a left or right dominant brain. Very few, very few. We like to think that we use one more than the other. I'm with you. <laughs> I like to think I'm left brain dominant. I have no creativity. <laughs> if you go to my home, I have no decorations. Why? I have nothing on my walls. I have nothing. Why? Because my left brain says I have to dust that. I have to clean that. I don't want to put any decorations out because I have to clean that. That's how I am. I'm wired logically. And I'm going to show you a video today of how our right brain and left brain and some individuals can be completely disconnected. And there are some individuals where they are quote, right brain, and they are artistic, and they are not logical. And then there are some people that are definitely left brain, and they are logical. You said this, this is what I do, this is what I see, this is what I say. There is no deviation. Sort of like Sheldon from Big Brain, Big Bang Theory, right? Yeah, Josh. Your brain can rewire itself. Like if, if the sides they get separated, they, they can like come back together. And like, I can't remember what it's called, but they like um, not easily. No, but like they so that's separated. that's why they kind of did lobotomies back in the day. They would cut through the corpus callosum, and that's the part of white matter axons. So you need to know white matter. White matter means Anything that's myelinated, axons are myelinated. Anything that's gray matter is likely neuronal cell bodies or axons that aren't myelinated. But the corpus callosum is a part of your brain that connects the cerebral hemispheres, right brain to left brain. And they used to go through and cut that to help with seizure activity, manic behavior, you know, those people that would commit horrendous crimes back in the day. You see Shutter Island? Yeah. Stick the knife in, scramble the brains. That's what they were doing. They were trying to disconnect right versus left brain. And can it reconnect? Mm, not well. Neurons are considered post mitotic. So they don't re regrow very well. It's not like an axon out here with nerves that are severed that could regrow. In the brain, it, it, not so much. What about plasticity? Okay, so Cynthia said plasticity. That's a, a reference to memories. Um, I'm going to use an example, okay? Okay, my honey kidnapped me this weekend. He does this every once in a while. He will just, I think we're going to a family member's house and next thing I know we're on a trip. He did this. 
He likes to steal me away, and we have this cute little getaway. He took me away to Joshua Tree Park, a, a national monument park, national park. <clears throat> Why? To see the super blue, all the flowers blooming. Super sweet. As we checked out yesterday morning before we were racing to go to the national park, see all the flowers, we're racing out of the, apart the, the hotel room and because I'm worried I have to get to work. I have to get to work. He has our duffel bag with my blankie and pillow because he always knows to pack that. And he has his work bag. We get to the checkout counter, front, front counter. I see in my mind his shoulder bag slide off. He has the duffel bag and he's handing the woman at the front desk our card, our card key. It says we're checking out of room 427. She takes the card key, says there's nothing else to do, sir. And I see him do this with a duffel bag. And in my mind's eye, I saw him in my mind's eye pick up his work bag, which he did not do. And there was a lip over the, the checkout desk. We leave. We go all the way home, two and a half hours home, only to get out of the car and he doesn't have his work bag with his work computer. His lifeblood was left underneath the checkout counter. So plasticity is like memory. And it's not just memory long-term, it's short-term memory, short-term. And it's also muscle memory. Do I remember the weight? So Honey did not remember the weight of his bag. He had the weight of the duffel bag on the other side and to him, his plasticity, that was on his dominant side. So when his work bag left and he did this and he left in his mind's eye, his mind's muscle memory, his plasticity, he thought, I have my bag. Honey drove over six hours yesterday, toing and froing, back and forth. He got home, he dropped me off, I got to work on time. He went all the way back to Joshua Tree to get his work back and drove all the way back. So plasticity is this idea of memory but memory doesn't mean that you will always remember. Memory is different than just cognitive thinking. It's muscle memory. How far are you? Who's this guy? You have to introduce yourself now. Hi. I'm an interloper. Do you know who he is? Oh. Do you know who he is? Yes. It's a guy who rides these bikes. This is Professor Tay. Oh. Pretend to ride a bike. He is awesome. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be, I'll be right back. No problem. <laughs> so, Tay, plasticity. What I do you know? Plastic. <laughs> I try to be. Yeah. <laughs> I need some help dancing sometimes. Can't do that, Carlton. Yeah. <laughs> Go. It's <laughs> <coughs> awesome. Plasticity is about memory, but it's not about cognitive memory. It's about motor memory. For example, I can give you another example, Cynthia. I'm used to, I hate to say this, I'm used to my toilet in my bathroom, the toilet I use. The lights can be off, it could be the middle of the night, I have memory plasticity. I know how far I have to do this before I have contact. The hotel room that we were in, 
the toilet bowl was a lot lower. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times in the sleep, sleepy, sleepy, with my coughing, and I was like, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> and grabbing onto the handicap railing because I was like, oh, I'm gonna fall in. <laughs> that was so that's plasticity. It's it's memory, but it's not just about thoughts and awareness of thoughts. It's also about motor memory. Have you had that happen? Especially with toilets, right? That's a good one. Like you're like, oh, I'm just gonna go pee. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> we were talking about toilets and memory plasticity. Toilets. Oh. My toilet at home is higher. The hotel toilet was lower. So in the middle of the night, I could sleep. I was like, Whoa! <laughs> I used to have no problem. The hotel toilet was too high. Not the toilet. Okay. <laughs> All right, so then that's why that's why in the middle that's why in the middle of the night instead of turning around and just sit this way. <laughs> Actually, that's a real thing. Yeah. Right, fellas? Is this how you go in the bathroom in the middle of the night? What? <laughs> like this with the window. No, so you, but then you then you kind of got you got you got this. Right? Well, we know by sound if we're making it in or not. You know. Yeah, but so what, what about all the splash? <laughs> exactly. If you do splash, you gotta crack. <laughs> And then, and then, especially when you get the splatter on your leg. Yeah. It's right. like, and then you're like, oh, man, you got to step forward a little bit more. You thought I was just me. <laughs> Witness. <laughs> Be careful. I will. Thank okay. You. Bye. <laughs> Mac actually does, he goes to the bathroom when he comes home from school. He'll go big potty because he won't go big potty at high school. So he'll come home and he'll do the for the whole forward thing, and he'll do homework. He'll have everything set up on the toilet bowl and just be backwards. He's doing homework. I'll, and I, when he was younger, I'd be like, "Do you want a slice of pizza? Do you want food?" And he'd he'd get work done. <laughs> He's now 15. He doesn't do that so much anymore. I don't think I've ever seen like, reverse cowgirl in a pumpkin toilet. <laughs> Try it. You can get a lot done. Think about how many orgies and searches and actions you could have had done. So, to, to re you thought it was just me crazy in this department. You just saw Tay. <coughs> anterior. We don't really think of anterior for the brain because it has so many parts to it. And when you were forming your brain, it was it was like a balloon, um, an animal balloon. Have you ever seen animal animal balloon artists? Like they blow and they turn. And then they start doing. That's your brain. So, and it starts folding, and there are flexures. So, what was anterior? We really don't say that anymore. We say anterior is really rostral. Posterior is really caudal, tail towards the tail. Gyri. Gyri are all these bumps that you see. All the bumps on the brain. Gyri. Gyrus singular. And if I were to go to Sierra and poke one of her gyri, one gyrus, her somatosensory cortex gyrus, she'd be every time every time I zapped it, she'd be like, I feel some I feel like I just got a paper cut in my pinky toe. Even though that didn't happen. Who gets a paper cut in their pinky toe? No, in the pinky toe, not in between. Oh, it's even worse. I know, it's weird. Sulci, sulcus, those are the invaginations. And the sulci are division, like plates. So the sulci, the division line. Your central sulcus, ahead of it, is your pre-central gyrus. 
Behind it is the postcentral gyrus. The central sulcus separates the two gyri. So the sulci are the invaginations, and they are division lines. They're the line cut in the sand. And then the lobes, as I told you all, you've got frontal lobes, parietal lobes, temporal lobes, occipital lobes, and each lobe is going to be responsible for a certain set of interpretation of sensations and a certain set of outgoing commands. Whether you're conscious of them or not is a different story. You're not aware of all the incoming sensations that are coming into your brain right now. Alexa, can you tell me about your heart rate right now? Can you tell me exactly what your heart rate is? No. Brandon, can you tell me exactly what the output is for your pancreas? Are you really? So, like I said, animal balloons, right? So, your central nervous system, this was the animal balloon being blown up. One, two. And from that, the animal balloon artist started to make all these bends and flexures. So from the tube, we start to get separation, different, different regions. And I like to remember, tell Diana the message, meet Milo. Tell Diana the message, meet Milo. Tell encephalon. This is the region that's going to create your cerebral hemispheres, the biggest bulk of your brain. When you dissect the sheep brain, biggest bulk of the brain. This is where most of the shit is going down. Sensations, interpretation of the sensations, outgoing commands. The cerebral hemispheres are the biggest part of your brain. I'm gonna show you a video where what you see is mostly the cerebral hemispheres. Tell Diana, diencephalon, the, why do I say the? In the diencephalon, what comes from that are the thalamuses, the thalami. That's why I said the. Epithalamus, thalamus, hypothalamus, the, the. And in the diencephalon, where the thalami are, epithalamus, hypothalamus, the third ventricle, a space in your soft tissue, the ventricles are areas in your brain that are filled with cerebral spinal fluid to levitate your brain, lighten the load. If you did not have the ventricles, your head would be so heavy. It's like 11 pounds almost. You'd be like this the whole day. You'd be like this. The ventricles are filled with cerebral spinal fluid. It helps, it's buoyancy, it's liquid. It helps levitate your brain. In the cerebral hemispheres, you have the right and left ventricle, ventricle one and two, large ventricles filled with fluid, buoyancy to levitate your brain. In the diencephalon, you have the third ventricle, and around that are the thalami, epithalamus, thalamus, hypothalamus. Epithalamus, the only part on the sheep brain that you will see when Professor Innan shows it to you, will be the pineal gland. It helps regulate your day-night circadian rhythms. Thalamus, thalamus is the switch breaker, the operator, switch breaker. Back in the day, you would have to phone the operator and say, I would like to make a call to so-and-so. And the operator, the switch operator, would have to work the circuit board and connect your call. Some of you are looking at me like, what? That was ever a top 
That was actually a time. And the switchboard operator actually knew your business. They knew who you called, how often. It was horrible. There was no privacy. And they would eavesdrop on you. That's your thalamus. It's the switchboard operator. It knows what's coming in, what's going out. And it, so you go here, you go there, you go there. Hypothalamus. Hypothalamus, small. The shape of an almond. The size of an almond. And it controls so many things in your body. Rage, emotions, sex drive, thirst, hunger, size of an almond. And it controls all of those primitive behaviors in you. So those are the thalami. Tell Diana the message, mesencephalon parts of the mesencephalon that you will know in the sheet brain. Cerebral aqueduct connects the third ventricle to the fourth. More of this will become, uh, right now you're not even entertaining this right now because you're like origins, insertions, and actions. <laughs> the cerebral aqueduct is a way for the cerebral spinal fluid to drain from the third ventricle to the fourth. Met, metencephalon. That's where we're gonna find the pons and cerebellum. Pons is part of the is part of the brain stem. Cerebellum is not part of the brain stem, but it's associated, it's in close proximity. Pons very important for um, fine motor control, control pain, uh, cerebellum, coordination, coordination. How many of you have taken dance? Okay, uh, played sports of any kind. You have your cerebellum to thank. Have you gone bowling? We do this, right? Bowling. It's like three steps, right? One, two, three, bam! That's your cerebellum. Like, we will look graceful in this activity. <laughs> That's your cerebellum. People who are not graceful don't have a well developed cerebellum. So, if they're like, ah, you can go, oh, they don't have a good cerebellum. They're babies. <laughs> And then myelencephalon, that's the last part of your brainstem. That's your medulla oblongata, where the most primitive centers controlling your breathing, your heart rate, your blood pressure, most primitive structures and control of your body. Hugely important. So, I'm going to end with the video that I said that I would show you. I've already told you about the white matter. White matter is the myelination. I told you about the cortex, the amplitude of two to four millimeters. Tracts are axons, nuclei are clusters of uh, neuronal cell bodies. I already told you about that. Meninges, I will tell you about more. In just a moment, I would rather tell you or show you a video Get your mind off of it, of your exam, I should say. <laughs> Jill Bolte Taylor. She is a neuroanatomist. She actually had a stroke.
I grew up to study the brain because I have a brother who has been diagnosed with a brain disorder, schizophrenia. And as a sister and later as a scientist, I wanted to understand why is it that I can take my dreams, I can connect them to my reality, and I can make my dreams come true. What is it about my brother's brain and his schizophrenia that he cannot connect his dreams to a common and shared reality, so they instead become delusion? So I dedicated my career to research into the severe mental illnesses, and I moved from my home state of Indiana to Boston, where I was working in the lab of Dr. Francine Bennis in the Harvard Department of Psychiatry. And in the lab, we were asking the question, what are the biological differences between the brains of individuals who would be diagnosed as normal control as compared with the brains of individuals diagnosed with schizophrenia, schizoaffective, or bipolar disorder? So we were essentially mapping the microcircuitry of the brain, which cells are communicating with which cells, with which chemicals, and then in what quantities of those chemicals. So there was a lot of meaning in my life because I was performing this type of research during the day, but then in the evenings and, and on the weekends, I traveled as an advocate for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. But on the morning of December 10, 1996, I woke up to discover that I had a brain disorder of my own. A blood vessel exploded in the left half of my brain. And in the course the of four hours, the I watched my brain completely deteriorate in its ability to process all information. On the morning of the hemorrhage, I could not walk, talk, read, write, or recall any of my life. I essentially became an infant in a woman's body. If you've ever seen a human brain, it's obvious that the two hemispheres are completely separate from one another. And I have brought for you a real human brain. Pay attention to the size of this. That is the size, so the size of your spinal cord. this is a human brain. This is the front of the brain the back of the brain with the spinal cord hanging down. And this is how it would be positioned inside of my head. And when you look at the brain, it's obvious that the two cerebral cortices are completely separate from Those are the head. hemispheres. For those of you who understand computers, our right hemisphere functions like a parallel processor, while our left hemisphere functions like a serial processor. The two hemispheres do communicate with one another through the corpus callosum, which is made up of some 300 million Absence. axonal fibers. But other than that, the two hemispheres are completely separate. Because they process information differently, each of our hemispheres think about different things, they care about different things, and dare I say, they have very different personalities. Excuse me. Thank you. It's been a joy. <laughs> Our right human hemisphere is all about this present moment. It's all about right here, right now. Our right hemisphere, it thinks in pictures, and it learns kinesthetically through the movement of our bodies. That's what you're banking on today. Information in the form of energy streams in simultaneously through all of our sensory systems, and then it explodes into this enormous collage of what this present moment looks like, what this pro present moment smells like and tastes like, what it feels like, and what it sounds like. I am an energy being connected to the energy all around me through the consciousness of my right hemisphere. We are energy beings connected to one another through the consciousness of our right hemispheres as one human family. And right here, right now, we are brothers and sisters on this planet here to make the world a better place. And in this moment, we are perfect, we are whole, and we are beautiful. My left hemisphere, our left hemisphere, is a very different place. Our left hemisphere thinks linearly and methodically. Our left hemisphere is all about the past, 
and it's all about the future. Our left hemisphere is designed to take that enormous collage of the present moment and start picking out details, details, and more details about those details. It then categorizes and You're organizes also all that information, that today. associates it with everything in the past we've ever learned, and projects into the future all of our possibilities. And our left hemisphere thinks in language. It's that ongoing brain chatter that connects me and my internal world to my external world. It's that little voice that says to me, hey, you gotta remember to pick up bananas on your way home. I need them in the morning. It's that calculating intelligence that knows, that reminds me when I have to do my laundry. But perhaps most important, it's that little voice that says to me, I am, I am. And as soon as my left hemisphere says to me, I am, I become separate. I become a single, solid individual, separate from the energy flow around me and separate from you. And this is a portion of my brain that I lost on the morning of my stroke. On the morning of the stroke, I woke up to a pounding pain behind my left eye. And it was the kind of pain, caustic pain, that you get when you bite into ice cream. And it just gripped me, and then it released me. And then it just gripped me, and then it released me. And it was very unusual for me to ever experience any kind of, of pain, so I thought, okay, I'll just start my normal routine. So I got up and I jumped onto my cardio glider, which is a full body, full exercise machine. And I'm jamming away on this thing, and I'm realizing that my hands look like primitive claws grasping onto the bar. And I thought, that's very peculiar. And I looked down at my body, and I thought, whoa, I'm a weird looking thing. And it was as though my consciousness had shifted away from my normal perception of reality, where I'm the person on the machine having the experience, to some esoteric space where I'm witnessing myself having this experience. It was all very peculiar and my headache was just getting worse, so I get off the machine and I'm walking across my living room floor and I realize that everything inside of my body has slowed way down. And every step is very rigid and very deliberate. There's no fluidity to my pace and there's this constriction in my area of perception, so I'm just focused on internal systems. And I'm standing in my bathroom getting ready to step into the shower and I could actually hear the dialogue inside of my body. I heard a little voice saying, okay, you muscles, you gotta contract and you muscles, you relax. And, and then I lost my balance and I'm propped up against the, the wall. And I looked down at my arm and I realized that I can no longer define the boundaries of my body. I can't define where I begin and where I am, because the atoms and the molecules of my arm blended with the atoms and molecules of the wall. And all I could detect was this energy, energy. And I'm asking myself, what is wrong with me? What is going on? And in that moment, my brain chatter, my left hemisphere brain chatter, went totally silent. Just like someone took a remote control and pushed the mute button, total silence. And at first I was shocked to find myself inside of a silent mind, but then I was immediately captivated by the magnificence of the energy around me. And because I could no longer identify the boundaries of my body, I felt enormous and expansive. I felt at one with all the energy that was, and it was beautiful there. And then all of a sudden, my left hemisphere comes back online and it says to me, hey, we got a problem, we got a problem, we gotta get some help. And I'm going, oh, I got a problem, I got a problem. So I'm like, okay, okay, I got a problem. But then I immediately drifted right back down <laughs> into the consciousness. And I affectionately refer to this space as La La Land. But it was beautiful there. Imagine what it would be like to be totally disconnected from your brain chatter that connects you to the external world. So here I am in this space and my job and any stress related to my, to my job, it was gone. And I felt lighter in my body. And imagine all of the relationships in the external world and any stressors related to any of those, they were gone. I felt this sense of peacefulness. <laughs> Imagine what it would feel like to lose 37 years of emotional baggage. Oh, I felt 
euphoria. Euphoria. It was beautiful. And then again, my left hemisphere comes online and it says, hey, you've got to pay attention. We've got to get help. And I'm thinking, I've got to get help. I've got to focus. So I get out of the shower and I mechanically dress. I'm walking around my apartment and I'm thinking, I've got to get to work. I've got to get to work. Can I drive? Can I drive? And in that moment, my right arm went totally paralyzed by my side. And I realized, oh my gosh, I'm having a stroke. I'm having a stroke. And then the next thing my brain says to me is, wow. This is so cool. <laughs> this is so cool. How many brain scientists have the opportunity to study your own brain from the inside out? <laughs> and then it crosses my mind. But I'm a very busy woman. <laughs> I don't have time for a stroke. It's like, okay, I can't stop the stroke from happening, so I'll do this for a week or two, and then I'll get back to my routine. Okay. So I gotta call help, I gotta call work. I could remember the number of work. So I remember in my office I had a business card with my number on it. So I go in my business room, I pull out a three inch stack of business cards and I'm looking at the card on top and even though I could see clearly in my mind's eye what my business card looked like, I couldn't tell if this was my card or not because all I could see were pixels. And the pixels of the words blended with the pixels of the background and the pixels of the symbols, and I just couldn't tell. And then I would wait for what I call a wave of clarity. And in that moment, I would be able to reattach to normal reality. And I could tell, that's not the card, that's not the card, that's not the card. It took me 45 minutes to get one inch down inside of that second card. In the meantime, for 45 minutes, the hemorrhage is getting bigger in my left hemisphere. I do not understand numbers. I do not understand the telephone, but it's the only plan I have. So I take the phone pad and I put it right here. I take the business card, I put it right here, and I'm matching the shape of the squiggles on the card to the shape of the squiggles on the phone pad. But then I would drift back out into La La Land and I'll remember it when I come back if I've already dialed those numbers. So I had to wheel my paralyzed arm like a stump and cover the numbers as I went along and push them so that as I would come back to normal reality, I'd be able to tell, yes, I've already dialed that number. Eventually, the whole number gets dialed and I'm listening to the phone and my colleague picks up the phone and he says to me, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> And I think to myself, oh my gosh, he sounds like a golden retriever. <laughs> and so I say to him, clear in my mind, I say to him, this is Jill, I need help. And what comes out of my voice is, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I said, oh my gosh, I sound like a golden retriever. So I couldn't know, I didn't know that I couldn't speak or understand language until I tried. So he recognizes that I need help and he, and he gets me help. And a little while later, I'm, I'm riding in an ambulance from one hospital across Boston to Mass General Hospital. And I curl up into a little fetal ball. And just like a balloon with the last, last <coughs> bit of air just, just right out of the balloon. I just felt my energy lift and just, I felt my spirit surrender. And in that moment, I knew that I was no longer the choreographer of my life. And either the doctors rescue my body and give me a second chance at life, or this was perhaps my moment of transition. When I woke later that afternoon, I was shocked to discover that I was still alive. When I felt my spirit surrender, I said goodbye to my life, and my mind was now suspended between two very opposite planes of reality. Stimulation coming in through my sensory system felt like pure pain. Light burned my brain like wildfire, and sounds were so loud and chaotic that I could not pick a voice out from the background noise, and I just wanted to escape because I could not identify the position of my body in space. I felt enormous and expansive, like a genie just liberated from her bottle and my spirit soared free like a great whale gliding through a sea of silent euphoria. 
marijuana. I found marijuana. What I remember thinking is, no way I would ever be able to squeeze the enormousness of myself back inside this tiny little body. But then I realized, but I'm still alive. I'm still alive, and I have found nirvana. And, and if I have found nirvana, and I'm still alive, then everyone who is alive can find nirvana. And I picture a world filled with beautiful, peaceful, compassionate, loving people who knew that they could come to this space at any time. And that they could purposely choose to step to the right of their left hemispheres and find this peace. And then I realized what a tremendous gift this experience could be. What, what a stroke of insight this could be to how we live our lives. And it motivated me to recover. Two and a half weeks after the hemorrhage, the surgeons went in and they removed a blood clot the size of a golf ball that was pushing on my language centers. Here I am with my mama, who's a true angel in my life. It took me eight years to completely recover. So who are we? We are the life force power of the universe with manual dexterity and two cognitive minds. And we have the power to choose moment by moment who and how we want to be in the world. Right here, right now, I can step into the consciousness of my right hemisphere where we are. I am the life force power of the universe. I am the life force power of the 50 trillion beautiful molecular geniuses that make up my form. At one with all that is. Or I can choose to step into the consciousness of my left hemisphere, where I become a single individual, a solid, separate from the flow, separate from you. I am Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor, intellectual, neuroanatomist. These are the we inside of me. Which would you choose? Which do you choose? and when. I believe that the more time we spend choosing to run the deep inner peace circuitry of our right hemispheres, the more peace we will project into the world and more peaceful our planet will be. And I thought that was an idea worth spreading. Thanks.